This video is from my course, AWS Lambda, A Practical Guide. If you enjoy this video, please check out the course link in the description section below. All right, everyone. So welcome back. In this section, we are going to be talking about function execution and how it creates a phenomenon called cold start. Now, if you recall in one of the previous sections when I was discussing how Lambda works under the hood, we discussed one of the initial steps where Lambda gets an execution request and it needs to find resources to run your function on. However, that's only just a small part of what Lambda does behind the scenes. So in this section, I want to go over more into the details of how a function execution works and how it creates a phenomenon called cold start. So let's just jump right into it. All right, so we're going to be looking at an example here. We're going to decompose a function execution. So there's four discrete steps uh, in addition to actually finding the resource to run that code on. So our first step is for code download. So we need to go ahead and go grab that zip or jar file or executable that you provided to AWS Lambda when you were initially setting up your function. Now, typically when folks have a lot of dependencies that they want to incorporate into their Lambda function, they don't do this through the Lambda editor available through the console. They'll just go ahead and upload that zip file or jar file or executable. And this of course depends on the programming language that you're using and they'll upload that to S3. So when a function execution comes in, the first thing that needs to happen is that Lambda needs to go out and fetch that code. Uh, so it needs to transfer it from S3 onto the local machine that's going to be running your function. Now keep in mind here that an assumption of this scenario is that we haven't run this Lambda function before. This is either the first time or it's been a period where we've had a lot of active downtime and there's no active containers available to handle our functions request. So that's the first step. It's just downloading that function code. Now the next step is to start the execution environment. So starting the execution environment, of course, depends on the programming language that you are using. Certain languages tend to take a little bit longer here. I've noticed with the Java programming language and other compiled languages, this does take quite a bit of time. Whereas if you're using something like Node.js or Python, I've noticed that it's a very, very short duration for starting the execution environment. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about which language you want to use when you're using Lambda. It isn't always the best idea to go with the language you're necessarily most comfortable with, uh, you also need to think about these things behind the scenes, such as you know how this uh, affects the startup time of your Lambda functions. All right, so after that's taken place, so after we've downloaded our code and after we've started our execution environment, the next step is to execute the initialization code. Now the initialization code, if I just take a look at an example here that we have down below, is the portion of your Lambda function that is outside of the handler function. So if I just grab my mouse here and let's go down here really quick. Um, so this portion up here, we are, like I said in the comments here, we're importing some required libraries. Uh, so we're using AWS X-Ray SDK Core, we're using X-Ray SDK for MySQL, we're using MySQL 2, and we're using a library called SQLize. We're also doing some other stuff such as extracting environment variables from our runtime environment. This doesn't impact performance as well, just uh, good to know that this is what it looks like. And then of course, the, the main portion here is our actual logic. So we have our handler function uh, taking an event and then like I'm kind of insinuating here, creating a database connection and doing whatever uh, logic that it needs to do. So this third phase here involves everything that I'm kind of circling. So this top portion here, the importing of the libraries and anything else that takes place outside of the handler function itself, which is this portion down here. So for this reason, it's important to minimize the number of imports that you have here. You don't want to have imports that you're not necessarily using and you don't want to be too liberal with your imports. For example, uh, in a language like Java, you can just do import star from something and get every um, dependency that exists in that package. But you can also import specific dependencies from that package. So that is much preferred as opposed to being too generous with your imports, which can slow down the function startup time, which is you know the purpose of this whole exercise. Uh, so keep that in mind. This is what occurs uh, during the third step here. It's initializing this portion. So pulling all of the um, imports into the execution environment and pulling any other things uh, that you specified in further sections. Now the next section is to actually execute the handler code, which is our final step. So that's what happens at the bottom here. And then uh, from that point, we do what we need to do. We run our business logic and then return the response back to the caller. 
Uh, so those are the four main components that consist of a function execution. So in the beginning, I talked to you about cold start and how cold start is a very big problem for a lot of applications because it can adversely impact the latency of your application, especially when there's periods of low or no usage for your function. So such as, you know, during the evening where you may not have a lot of customers. And this also occurs if you are creating a new version of your application. So if you're uploading another version of your Lambda function, all of the previous containers that were existing need to be reaped in the term of Lambda, which is basically means to just tear them down. Uh, and also we need to start up new containers that are gonna be running that new code. So it's not like uh, portions can be reused. We need to kind of repeat this entire process when that, whenever those two things happen. But that's not completely true because it turns out that Lambda uh, doesn't do this, this four step process every time. It only does a certain portion of these steps every time. Um, so let's assume here for a second that we're running our Lambda function for the first time, right? So these are the four steps that need to occur. One, two, three, and four. And I want to bucketize this into three discrete sections here. So that's what these arrows are uh, delineating here. Uh, so starting with the left-hand section that contains one and two, if you get a function execution and you don't have any containers that are available at all in that scenario, you know, where you have no traffic, then that would be considered a full cold start. So it needs to download the code and start the execution environment. This all happens behind the scenes and can take some time. I've noticed in my experience that using Java, uh, you can see some cold start times, although they advertise it on the AWS documentation as you know just a couple of seconds or so, I've seen it up to one minute of cold start. And one minute is a pretty absurd number. Like if you're making an application where you need to service customer API requests, you can't have it where if a customer makes a request, it's gonna take over one minute to get a response back. Even if that's only for a couple invocations that can inversely impact uh, our customers. So we want to protect against that. It turns out though that egregiously long cold start times are kind of more of a abnormality that doesn't really happen very often. I do agree that typically you'll see like less than a couple seconds for cold starts on typical applications applications. But this just speaks to the need to keeping your dependency counts low um, for your code and also optimizing your imports so that you're not importing too much. Uh, so if you get an invocation request and nothing exists and you need to start by downloading the code and starting the execution environment, that is what is called a full cold start and that is completely outside of your control. Now I actually want to jump to the third section here, which is the scenario where, you know, we've already downloaded all the code. We've already started our execution environment. We've already executed our initialization code. So we basically have everything ready to go. Like the Lambda function is primed and ready. It's imported everything. It's downloaded everything. It's ready to go. If you are in this scenario, then what that is what's called a warm start. So the function invocation uh, can take place right away. There's no latency delays. There's no imports that need to take place. The container is primed and ready. So you get optimal uh, latency in that scenario. So that is what's called a warm start. That is the ideal scenario for a lot of applications. Um, and if you were hosting your application on something like, you know, EC2 or ECS, you're always going to have a warm start. You don't have this phenomenon that we're describing here. The only reason that this whole thing is worth discussing is because we're using serverless and this is how that illusion of serverless works behind the scenes. Now, if you don't have a warm start, then there's also this scenario here, which is the second middle one here. Uh, and that's what's called a partial cold start. And the reason I call it partial cold start is because at any point in time, Lambda can go ahead and reap uh, all the resources here. So there is a scenario here where Lambda will uh, keep a container that has your code already loaded on it. It'll keep your execution environment already established. Therefore, the only thing that we need to really do is go ahead and execute the initialization code and then execute the handler code. So if that occurs, if we're in that scenario, then that's what's called a cold start or a partial cold start. So not a full cold start, but a partial cold start. Latency penalties will not be as bad, but this means that it's also important for you to minimize the imports here so you can keep that as low as possible. So that's the anatomy of a function execution. Now I wanted to give you kind of a brief little warning here, and that is that cold start also occurs while scaling up. And there is a hard limit here uh, that Lambda will only scale up by 500 execution environments, so 500 containers per one minute. So if all of a sudden you're getting, I don't know, maybe 5,000 requests all, all of a sudden as a burst, 
then Lambda is gonna be a little bit slow to scale up. So during that time, you may see throttling. Now there is a way to mitigate this and we're gonna discuss that in the next slide, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a warning here that this can occur and discuss some of the mitigations in the next slide here. Okay, so let's move on to that now, which is strategies to minimize cold start. Now I do wanna point out here that a lot of folks in the Lambda and serverless community have come up with some pretty interesting ways to minimize cold start. Uh, for example, some folks have built um, a library that uses CloudWatch events to wake up every minute or so and just invoke your functions 20 times, for example, in a parallel fashion, which theoretically should create 20 different containers uh, so that, you know, if requests come in, you already have warm containers that are ready to go to run your code immediately in that warm start scenario that we discussed. However, that is not guaranteed to work. This is kind of like a hacky approach that people figured out kind of works, but not really. Uh, however, there are some very concrete steps that you can take. Some of them we already covered, but let's get into them now. Uh, so the first one is, of course, to minimize the number of library dependencies that you're using in your application. Don't incorporate things into your zip file, jar file, whatever you're using to upload your code. Don't incorporate things that you're not actually using in your function itself. This is just going to add additional overhead during that cold start process and make this worse for your customer. Now, the next one here is to, of course, only import what you need. Uh, so some tips there, like I mentioned before, in languages like Java, don't do import start. Stars. Don't import things egregiously if you're not going to actually use them in your function execution. That's just going to add to that partial cold start warm up time. Now, the next one is to raise your memory configuration. So the reason this works is because raising your memory configuration is the primary lever that you have really, not only to just improve your memory configuration, but it turns out that raising your memory configuration also increases the type of machine that you're provisioning behind the scenes and the CPU power of that machine. So if you raise your memory configuration, part of the bottleneck of the cold start is, you know, loading all of your dependencies and executing everything from your initialization step. That is normally CPU bound. So if you raise your memory configuration, you're gonna have a better CPU that can chug through this a lot faster and therefore minimize your cold start. Uh, I don't suggest you just jack up your memory configuration to something higher just to minimize cold start. Uh, there's another way, which is my next point here, that can help you minimize this, but it is a little bit of a expensive option. So the final option is to use a function called provision concurrency. And this is something that we're going to get into into my next slide here, but I just wanted to tease it to you. Provision concurrency is the idea that we can have Lambda functions that are always on, always in that warm state, ready to receive traffic. So already initialized, the code's already been downloaded, the execution environment has already been established, the initialization is already run. Uh, so we can have a certain number of Lambda containers always on running behind the scenes so that whenever traffic comes in, we can immediately respond to it without having to do all those extra steps in between. Uh, again, this is a very expensive option and I'm going to discuss it a lot more in our next section which is on concurrency and throttling so stay tuned.